schools tend to be closed for two reasons. They have low enrollment and they have low performance. Um, it's very rare that a school only has one of those characteristics and is closed. Um, they have low enrollments oftentimes because they're in communities um, that have declining population. These are often communities that um, you know, are seen as um, um, less desirable places to live. They might have high crime rates. Um, they tend to have high rates of poverty. Um, we see that they have low, the schools have low performance, and it's hard to disentangle. Do they have low performance because they're not serving students well, or do they have low performance because they're serving very disadvantaged students, often students who are living in the area because the families, their families don't have the resources to live anyplace else. It's really hard to disentangle those, those two factors. Um, when you close the schools, it's, um, it's a really difficult process um, because those are usually, you know, families that are extremely vulnerable, students that are extremely vulnerable. Um, again, they're going to those schools because they don't have a lot of options. They're living in the neighborhoods because they don't have a lot of options. So a lot of times students will have, um, you know, you'll have a lot of students with diverse learning needs, you know, disabilities, um, Students with, you know, that are struggling with problems around health, problems at home, family instability, um, economic instability in their family, um, families under high stress. And so closing the school, when you close the school, you, you're, you know that you're introducing additional stress to the families. And so it's going to be really difficult for them. Um, on the other hand, you know, f from a district perspective, it can be you know, really hard to try to justify keeping those schools open if they have very low enrollments. Um, they could be very costly to run given the number of students that they have. Um, and they also have very low performance. And so you have to wonder, you know, are they really serving students well? Um, you know, a lot of times schools have been closed for low performance, though, again, based on whether or not students are meeting certain testing criteria, you know, certain scores on standardized tests. Um, and it's not always clear that the schools are not serving students well and that the students would do better in other schools. Um, and, and, you know, you will be, you know, expecting the, you know, students to make an additional school shift, right? They're in, inducing school mobility. And we know that school mobility can be really um, difficult for, you know, for students to make new adjustments. They have to establish new relationships, um, new relationships with new school staff, new relationships with peers, and families have to figure out new transportation options. So it's a difficult thing to do from everybody's perspective. Um, if we look at whether um, students benefit, um, we find in general that students who um, were in closed schools, they tend to go to schools that are very similar to the schools that were closed because, you know, they're going to go to schools that are also in their neighborhood or close to their neighborhood. Um, those, and schools that have enough space to take you know, schools from, you know, students from the closed school. And so those will also be also schools in very poor areas with declining population, um, you know, that are located near the neighborhoods from the, of the closed schools um, that also have low performance because, again, they're serving a lot of students who are living in high poverty. Um, and what we find is that students don't do any better at the new schools than they did at the old schools. Um, and you can see that it's, you know, good or bad. I mean, the good thing is they didn't do worse because, you know, they were forced to make a school move. On the other hand, here we've closed schools. Um, we've, put, you know, put a lot of families through a lot of stress, and their students aren't doing any better. Um, and so, you know, it's a really difficult situation to know what to do, um, especially when, as a district, you are charged with, um, you know, trying to run your schools efficiently and also wanting to make sure all your schools have strong academic performance. Well, I, I think we, um, I, and I say this without trying to exaggerate the issue, but I think there is somewhat of a war on poor people and um, people of color. And so I, I think that when you apply just a very um, sort of quantitative set of measurements onto a problem like this, then you're going to say, okay, the school's underused. 
the school doesn't have good um, results. So we can we we don't pay attention to the issues of of class, race, or or those things that are, are somewhat in tangible, they're not quantifiable in such, or poverty and the effects of poverty. So you apply, we apply a narrow lens and that's what's going to happen. And I, I really think it is an assault on, um, on poor, poor people, poor communities, poor students, uh, and that it's something that if this country doesn't, it, it's broader than that. We have these huge income disparities that we all know about. I think if the country doesn't deal with those kinds of issues, we're doomed. In the context of this notion of school closures, there is built in this notion of accountability, right? So like, why is this particular school continuing to fail? What's being done here? Some, you know, Someone is responsible for this, and I'm not using responsibility or accountability to sort of engage in, you know, this notion of sort of punitive and you need, and the consequences are you need to suffer. I think we need to try and understand what's going on and remediate it. And that part of that remediating it is in this notion of improvement. So how do we improve things? Is it better for kids to get on a bus and spend you know, 40 minutes to an hour going to a school that is farther away from them, from them because their local school closed? I don't know. I, you know I, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, at the end of the day, I think if they're getting a better education 40 minutes away, yes, it makes sense. Um, even if it means that they are walking those 40 minutes away. If they're getting a better education, I think it makes sense. Well, sometimes school closures are unavoidable. You know, when you've got a rundown building that's only a third full, it just doesn't make sense to keep going. So let's sort of agree that sometimes you just have to do it. It just doesn't make any sense otherwise. But if you're talking about school closure as a school improvement strategy, that's when we get sort of um, uh, more difficult. There have been a number of studies, at least a couple in Chicago, looking at the results of school closures. And uh, Chicago studies show, you know, it totally depends on where the child goes from the closed school. If they end up in a higher performing school, they're likely to do better. If they end up in a school that's no better or worse than the school that closed, they're also they're likely to do as badly or worse. So the biggest variable here is in what happens to the kids after. So you know, New York City has um, also closed very large, very you know sort of dropout factory high schools over the years. But they've had a really nice sort of choice system. They replaced the great big difficult high schools with small schools across the city, very well planned, well resourced. Uh, and there's very rigorous research to show that these small schools have actually served these students much better than what they would have had in their big schools. They have much higher graduation rates, they had much higher college going rates. And so, so I, what it, uh, boils down to is what's the alternative to the closure, I think. And and in a community, it's how well you engage the stakeholders and the discussions about this, how well you communicate this. I think that I think those are really the key issues. I, I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that systematic school closures or downsizing in the case of Detroit or Kansas City um, actually leads to, to better learning outcomes. I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that. I think there are some basic efficiency arguments that are logical that you can't possibly sustain chronically under-enrolled schools, so at some points elected officials um, and appointed officials have to make that call. Uh, but I don't know of much evidence to suggest that it's, it's, um, it's the, uh, it leads to, 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 to greater learning outcomes. I think if, again, I was the um, supreme allied commander of all schools in our country and we were a nationalized government like 
some of the countries that have made pretty significant progress over um, the last two decades um, that aren't America. I would be interested in leveraging something from the charter school um, world, and that would be to say all schools should be on a five-year performance contract. We should actually make it normal for people to, to be wired for performance, and that it doesn't mean we're going to close thousands of schools. But it does mean that closure is a reality, is a real possibility for schools that are chronically failing. And that schools that are just above that tier would be then targeted for particular kinds of supports, depending on what, what the problems or the, the struggles, issues were in those schools. But I think the idea that, that you're not just entitled to be a neighborhood school and fail children year after year after year would be a policy that, that would make sense for our country. School closures are complex. Um, on one hand, I firmly believe that every student should have access to the best education possible. And when you have a school sitting in a community that has underserved the community for three, four generations, then I question why we would want to keep that schoolhouse open even understanding that it is under-resourced or whatever the issues may be, if students are not achieving and it's not happening for three, four generations, then this is the community now. So I understand why that schoolhouse should be closed. But at the same time, I get that as a neighborhood community, schools become the hub for, for neighborhoods. Um, they become places of shelter, places to get together and do things. Um, and we oftentimes just say, my entire family went there. But I would beg people to ask the question, and how are we doing? You know, how are our lives? Are our lives better and different as a result of having gone to that school? And if the answer can't be yes, then either we need to demand more of the school or maybe the school shouldn't exist in the state that it does. I'd like to divide the idea of school closures into sort of two little, two buckets. The first bucket, I think, is fiscal um, responsibility. So if, if a particular building is only half filled because of depopulation, then that is not an efficient use of taxpayer money. So... I totally get how how devastating it is for a community to lose its school building, which in many cases has been the center of a lot of community activity, and what I, I, I totally get that. Um, but but I do think that people do need to be cognizant of fiscal responsibility. Okay, now uh, setting that aside and talking about closing schools because of poor performance, to me that feels different. Um, we talk about how schools have failed children for generations and therefore they are toxic places and should be closed. That That is an argument. I don't know what happens if you take that, that same, how do I, I think part of the toxicity is perhaps the adults in the building and their interactions with each other and their beliefs about the children they have. But I also think that part of the toxicity in the building is due to the, the particular groups of children who come together in that building. Um, if that same group of children are served, they don't change, and they are just, all we do is change the adults. I'm not positive that that works well. I don't know if that's enough. Uh, the question of school closures is extremely challenging. Um, I think for far too long in black and brown communities, it's been acceptable to receive subpar service from the institutions that are either in those communities or around those communities. 
on the south side of Chicago, there's the going joke, or at least there used to be the going joke that, you know, heavy snowstorm, you know, those streets are going to get plowed last. Downtown's going to get plowed first. North side's going to get plowed second. You know, Washington Park, Inglewood, they might get plowed. And so there's almost an expectation, right, that you get services that are less effective. If that's consistent, then you almost get used to underperformance. The park isn't clean. There's a long wait at the clinic or at the hospital. When you go into the government office that's in your neighborhood, you are going to wait an hour and a half and maybe not get treated right when you get there, treated professionally. That seeps into the school day. If the school seems not to be performing or if the lunch options aren't what they should be, or if the teachers aren't certified to teach math and they're teaching ninth grade algebra, then it seems, oh, well, we're kind of used to that. We weren't getting high quality service in the first place. It's going to be really hard at scale to overcome the challenges of poverty and institutionalized inequality if the services that you receive aren't effective. And so it's, it's imperative that students and families in tough neighborhoods across America have access to high quality health care, high quality parks, effective policing, and great schooling. So there's dissonance. It's also hard to just throw all of the blame on the teachers and administrators at a school that has been under-resourced for decades that is in a neighborhood where things happen that just shouldn't happen, that things happen right around the school that you can't even think about. It's hard to, it's hard to throw all of the blame on those hardworking educators and hardworking teachers and hardworking principals when 10 to 15 to 20 percent of their students are, are being identified as having a uh, special being special needs or qualifying for special education services, if so many of their students are coming to them having experienced loss, having experienced violence, uh, coming from households that have challenges and living in neighborhoods that are really difficult, just getting to school in itself was a task. So you can understand that context. At the same time, that's the job. And so the young people that live in that neighborhood and are going to that school need to be prepared to be successful in college. The economic landscape is such that without a college degree moving forward, it's going to be less likely that you're going to be able to live just even a, a standardly productive, somewhat happy, somewhat fulfilling life in America with the way that the economic divide continues to grow. College is essential now more than ever for the young people we serve. So I think there's got to be something that we do that says we cannot allow schools to consistently underserve the students that are enrolled there. But we've got to be equitable and we've got to be intentional about creating a context for so many of these schools that are in tough areas to succeed. Until you get that balance right, I think you'll see political feedback. I think you'll see community unrest. I think there won't be a sense of agreement that I understand why we're doing this. I get that this school hasn't done what it could do. It didn't do its best. And therefore, it may not need to be open. And your young man would be better served if he was at one of these three schools. To take that further, though, even closing 25 schools, what's the likelihood that those students that leave those 25 schools have access to a higher quality school? Are we going to ensure that, you know, those 12,500 students now have the ability to go to a higher performing school. If we don't, we've just moved those students around. You know, we've just moved them from one school to the other. Um, 
we've got, I think, actually larger than the school closing issue. Because I think the school closing issue is is probably just a, it's a consequence, really. It's not the root cause. Um, Until we get school funding right in lots of urban districts, we're going to have large pockets of underperforming schools. Um, it's it's just not feasible to me that we're still funding schools on property tax base. And then I'm a bit surprised that we're surprised at the results from the institutions or schools when they don't have access to the same resources. Those students we know are already starting behind by the time they walked into the school door. By the time they walked in at six, five, six, or seven, students from low-income situations are already behind their more well-to-do counterparts. So then we're going to double down that difference (laughs) by um, providing funds in an equitable way.